Did you know you can watch a life-giving kids service each week? Go to lifechurchgreenbay.com slash kids where your kids can learn about Jesus in a fun, uplifting way. New episodes release every Friday for you to watch and discuss. Make kids service a part of your kids' watching lineup. Summer is coming, and that means getting outdoors. Before you head on out, head online to set up a recurring gift. Your ongoing gift makes so much possible. We produce live services and generate fresh online resources and experiences. Recurring gifts also allow us to continue to support local and international missions that count on the support from Life Church. Online giving is safe, simple, and secure. So set it and forget it. Make summer simpler by setting up a recurring gift today. Looking for a great way to connect with your group of friends? We have downloadable resources to help you start your very own summer life group right now. Just go to our website where you will find all the tools and resources you need to start a group anytime, anywhere, and at any pace. Summer life groups are a great way to expand your faith and build a deeper relationship with your friends. Download your resources today. Hey, hi, welcome you guys. We're so glad that you're joining us today for this service online. Listen, if you are new to us or if you don't know what's even happening right now, we'd love it if we were able to connect with you. And so there should be a QR code right on your TV right now, or does anyone watch the TV? I don't even know. However you're watching us today, there's a way that you can connect with us just by pointing your phone at it or maybe even just typing it in, lifechurchgreenbay.com. We'd love to know that you're here, that you're watching, and that you're part of our family. One way or another, we just know that we love that you're here. We love the fact that you're generous. I know that right now uh, at Life Church, and Life Church does, we're extending um, an opportunity for you to help be generous in our community. There's a school collection. This is kind of school collection time. And so we're collecting um, like socks and underwear for like school age to high school age kids. And so if you wanna be generous like that, you can either um, go to lifechurchgreenbay.com and click on the wish list uh, for that, or you can just pick up some socks and underwear when the next time you're at the Target or Walmart or whatever, and put them in the barrel there in the lobby. We'd love to be able to give our kids and our community some love in that way and like some of the most basic things that we often take for granted. But every time you guys that we've ever asked you to do something, you've always come through in flying colors. And so know that we love how generous you are. I also wanna remind you that you can use that QR code to, uh, to um, facilitate your tithes and offerings. Listen, I wanna remind you about that, that that tithe and offering thing, that's not an arrangement or an agreement that you guys have with the church or that we have with you. That's a thing between you and God. And so, we feel like God has given us all, right? A, a, an allotment, right? Of time, talent, and treasure, right? Like we've all got those things in to some degree and in one way or another. And all he's asking for is a little bit of, of us giving some of that back, some of our time back, some of our talent back, and some of our treasure back because he wants to give through you. He wants to use you as a conduit of goodness in your time, talent, and treasure. And so if you're not used to doing that kind of thing, if you're not used to giving your time and not used to giving your talent or not used to giving your treasure, I want to invite you to try it. Like try it. The easiest way to do it is your treasure part because I mean you can do that on your phone. So you can easily set up recurring or one-time gifts uh, online doing that, but you can also try to, start, try to start figuring out a way that you can give your time and your talent as well. There's things that you can do that only you can do, and there's ways that you can get involved in Life Church and our community. We just wanna encourage you to do that. Life Church is a life-giving entity. We wanna bring life to our community, life to our neighbors, life to our city, and that's all dependent on you. One way or another, I'm glad that you're here. Enjoy this service.
Hey friends, open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter five. If you're not in a place where you have access to a traditional Bible, you can open up the YouVersion app, or it's also called the Bible app, and all the notes and scriptures, those have already been uploaded. Wherever it is that you're watching us from, I love you, and I am so grateful that you are a part of the Life Church family. Guys, what a message by Pastor Scott last week. I, I can't think of a better way to have kicked off this series. Like he sent me his notes a few weeks ago, and when I read them, I got so excited. I couldn't wait to hear it, and I couldn't wait for you to hear it either. And, and like, I learned so much. I, I mean, I've been to seminary, and I learned a ton in that message. I mean, when he said that the word beatitude comes from the same root word as beatification, which is one of the steps of sainthood in the Catholic tradition, somewhere after death and veneration, I was like, say what? Come on, man, you better stop. Or how he said the word blessed is most accurately understood as happy. I mean, like when he said that, that made me have to go back and substitute that word as I read Jesus' list. Like, happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are those who mourn. Happy are the meek. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Happy are the merciful or the pure in heart. Happy are the peacemakers. Happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And, and like when I put it into that context, it was like Jesus was saying, people who are opposite to the world will ultimately be the ones who are blessed or will ultimately be the ones who become happy. And so let's talk about that for a few minutes today in part two of our series, Becoming Jesus People. Let's pray. God, we love you. We honor you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do. You are great and you're greatly to be praised. You loved us before we ever even had an idea of loving you. And so we give you our hearts. We give you our minds. We pray today that your word would become flesh. It would take root in our hearts, that you'd find our hearts to be good soil, that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. So guys, the Mount of Beatitudes, if it's not the most, it's at least one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. That kind of caught me off guard because I, I used to picture it like Arizona or or like Kuwait, like like some dry, dusty, hot, humid, miserable place. But when I got there, and I was shocked. I, it messed with me. I was I was stunned by it. I literally was speechless. I I was shook because it felt like everything I had ever imagined in my mind was totally wrong. It was totally different. Like it's green and lush. It's actually tropical. It has these sweeping lawns and palm trees, a, a breathtaking view of the Sea of Galilee. It, it's, it's more like Hawaii than it is like Kuwait. And, and when we got to the spot that most likely hosted the crowd as Jesus spoke the most significant sermon that's ever been preached, it took my mind a minute to take it all in. It, it took my mind a minute to like, to like catch up and figure out that I was actually in the right place. Like, like picture this, thick, soft, luxurious, luscious grass, canopies of shade, fruit trees as far as the eye can see, bursts and pops of color from exotic plants and flowers and birds that are flying right across your face, rocks and berms that serve as these natural seats set on a slope that, that afforded you a full view of the sea with this constant, cool, refreshing breeze filled with the smell of the sea below. As the crowds gathered and settled, even laid back in this inviting environment, Jesus, he, he would have sat down took in his surroundings, took a deep, refreshing breath, and he would have begun, blessed are the, and the list would have began as 
Pastor Scott said last week, with the poor in spirit, those that mourn, the meek, and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then he would have got into the second phase, if you would. He said, blessed are the merciful. They're going to be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. They're going to see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. They're going to be called the children of God. And, th and then the one who really boggles our mind the most. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Theirs is the kingdom of God. These characteristics, these qualities, if you would, th these are what make up Jesus people, people who are merciful, who are pure in heart, people who are peacemakers, those who are persecuted, not for any reason other than for him. And guys, I want to be that. I want to be those qualities. And I, I want that for you too. I mean, like I want it so much that I've dedicated my entire life to the pursuit of it, not just for me, but for you and for your spouses, for your kids, for your neighbors, for your coworkers. And, and so I, I thought, how is it that we can take this idea that we have, this picture that we have of Jesus people, of what it really means to be that and how can we make it practical and so here's how we've adopted the pursuit of those things here at life church and beyond and it's as practical and as tangible as they can be and we found this is what sets us apart these characteristics the things i'm going to talk to you about today because because not everybody who's a christian as pastor scott said not everybody acts this way. The, the term Christian, it's gotten like a bum rap. It's, it's gotten tainted, if you would, through all sorts of different things that people have said and that people have done. And so this is the thing that separates Jesus people from non-Jesus people. It's five things we are as Jesus people. And, and these are actually the words that we as a church, use at our business downtown De Pere called The Exchange, the, the coffee, mercantile, and eatery. Downtown 317 North Main in De Pere, it has become kind of a culture creator in our city. It's, it's really become a place that when people come in, they're, they're confused by it if they don't know that it's owned by church. Like we, we intentionally made it a name of something that wasn't like a Christian name. Like we didn't name it Java Jira, your coffee provider on purpose. And, and we intentionally didn't brand it or externally connect it to Life Church. It was, it was promoted as a standalone business that just felt different. And people will traditionally come in and and talk about how it feels different and not be able to wrap their minds around it. And the reason for that is because what I'm gonna to talk to you about today, what it takes to become a Jesus person, it's what we have installed at the exchange to establish the culture. And in fact, our lead team at the exchange, they, they do regular Marco Polos to the staff and they continually come back and they go over these traits. They go over these characteristics. And so often you'll hear young men and women who aren't even believers, they'll be talking about these characteristics. And so, so these are five things we are as Jesus people. Here's the first. We are life-giving. If you're a Jesus person, you have to be life-giving in all we say and in all we do. Like we're a bright light in a dark environment. The Bible tells us not to hide our light under a bushel, to, to let people see it everywhere that we are. And so we honor people. We communicate with people in a respectful way. This is what Jesus people do when they have conversations with people. Th and these are so simple. I know that to some of you, you're going to go, this is so basic. And I've read this in every leadership book that I've ever read in my life. But, but people who are Jesus people, they make eye contact with one another. They, they remember people's names. They recite their names back to people. My, my father-in-law, Jack Foster, he has, for 25 years, he's been an image of Jesus to me. He's been such a, a beautiful guy. And one of the things that my father-in-law excels at is using people's names. You know, there's no sweeter sound in the English language than the sound of your own name. And so he does that by continually repeating your name when he meets you. And so Jesus people, we, we use people's names. We speak life and stop ourselves and stop other people from being life takers. Life is filled 
with life takers, isn't it? You work with them at your job, you live with them in your neighborhood. Some of you, you go to school with them and everything about them, they're just suckers of life. And every time you walk away from them, you feel like Bleh. it just robs you of your affection. We as Jesus people, we, we keep people from being negative, from being rude, from being gossipy, from being sarcastic, because we are life-giving. And if you're a Jesus person, you have to be too. Number two is we are kind. We have a joy that's inside of us and, and it fills us up and it goes from the bottom of our feet to the top of our heads and we're not always happy, but there's a difference between happiness and joy because for you to be happy, something has to happen to you. But for you to be joyful, things could be falling in around you. The world can be damaged everywhere that you look, but you know that inside of you, there's a, a joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The Bible says that we have joy unspeakable and we're filled with glory. We're kind in how we act and in how we react to people. We're welcoming and we're warm to everyone that we meet. This is one of the reasons why I don't get up there and wring my hands and talk about every political issue that comes around. Because guys, I love everybody. I, I welcome everybody. I, I don't agree with what everybody's doing, but I guess what? Not everybody agrees with what I'm doing. I have certain things that I think. I have certain things that have become part of my personality traits that some people don't like. And so here's the deal. If I'm going to be a Jesus person, Jesus said, come unto me, all who are, are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. And so for us to be Jesus people, we have to be welcoming. We have to be warm to everybody. We have to be genuine. And we have to have like this genuine hospitality. And the reason why we have this hospitality or this welcoming spirit about us is because we see people like they're on our side, like they're on our team. Why, why is it that so many people, especially Christians or church folk, as we'd call them in the South, why is it that so many of them are so known for the things that they're against? Why is it that they're so known for the things that they disagree with? Why is it that we look at people like they're the enemy or that they're the rival? Because here's the deal. And... I promise you, when I was writing this message, I felt like the Lord told me, I am going to separate the wheat and the chaff in this message. There's going to be some people who are going to get so excited about this, and there's going to be some people who are going to go, well, this, this is our off-ramp. Because here's the thing, I don't look at anybody like they're my enemy. Life is way too short for me to have people that I'm in opposition to. Life is too hard to find people that love you and who believe in you. And so as a Jesus person, I, I look at the model of Jesus and Jesus was like, bro, come on, man, you're a thief. Come on, bro. Like you're a sinner. Yeah, come on. Oh, you're a whore. Like, come on, man. And he's like having dinner and drinks with like sinners and tax collectors. And the only people that it made mad was religious people. The only one that it made mad were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And here's the deal. I don't want to be Pharisaical. I want to be somebody who's like Jesus. And so we look at people like they're on our team and they're on our side. Here's number three. Is that to be a Jesus person, we're peaceful. Now, that's not always easy. Like, like that one for me may be one of the hardest. But we're peaceful in our actions and our interactions. We leave people feeling better after being in our presence than they were when they got there. We're the thermostats rather than the thermometers. Like, like we set the temperature of our environment rather than reflecting it. You, you ever been in an environment where there's somebody and they're just being that guy, they're being loud, they're being rude, they're being disrespectful, they're being disruptive, and suddenly everybody else in the room becomes like that? Not me, bro. I ain't gonna be that. I'm not gonna reflect the negativity that you're putting forward. I want to be the one that comes in the room and promotes positivity, that promotes love, that promotes kindness, that promotes peace. And that's what Jesus people do. We determine that we're not going to be a reflection of the negativity or reflection of the complaining. I, I got on a plane the other day 
And I got switch seats right at the very end. Like, man, I had all my stuff packed up, had my little carry-on bag up top, and was sitting in my seat, and I was, like, I get settled in when I get on a plane, y'all. I put my stuff in the seat back pocket, I get my headphones on, I, I get my little show on, on my iPad. I like to start my show before the plane takes off, because I've heard the little speech a million times, and it just gets old. And I, I actually don't neg regularly watch the shows on the screen of the seat because it gets annoying to me when I'm in the middle of a show and the people come on 17 times during the flight to tell you the same thing that they told you when the flight began. And so I was settled into my seat, flight was about to take off, and the flight attendant came to me and said, oh, Mr. Hennessy, uh, we're gonna need to change your seat and uh, we're gonna move you uh, to here. And I. I was kind of like, oh man, this is, oh, wh whatever. It's fine, it's fine, as long as I get there. And so I got up, got my bag out of the overhead, went, there was no room in the overhead above me, so they had to check the bag. And I was doing everything I could to act like Jesus. So I was doing everything I could to just be joyful and peaceful and kind. And when I went to sit in, the guy who was in the aisle seat, he didn't want to get up. He was mad about something. I don't know what he was mad about. He was mad at the flight attendant. He was mad at me. He was mad at the airline. He was mad about the masks. I mean, he started trying to talk to me about the masks. I mean, like, he said, can you believe these effing masks that we got to put on? This is, this is, a, I mean, I heard the F word about eight times in two sentences. And he just wanted to go on and on. And he just rebelliously was keeping that mask right there and uh, he he was trying to complain to me and guys i i just looked at put my put my mask on my face put my headphones on and i just said bro um you're not gonna ruin my day you're you're i'm not gonna be the thermometer of your life and so as jesus people we we lighten the mood we we bring calm and we lift burdens but but we're also peacemakers there's a difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And people who are peacekeepers are people who are the thermometers. They just go along with the flow. But people who are, who are peacemakers, they live on, in, and for truth. A pastor, Buntani, used to say that you could say anything you want as long as you say it in love. And so when somebody's disrupting the peace or disturbing the peace, Jesus people, we address it. And we don't address it with 14 people around us. We don't address it on social media. We don't do it on YouTube or TikTok. We go right to those people and we make things right, right away. Here's the fourth thing. As Jesus people, we're teachable. Years ago, man, 25 years ago, I. I was youth pastoring in Memphis, Tennessee, and I, I was loving life, living the dream, working for one of my heroes, Dr. J.D. Middlebrook. Dr. Middlebrook, out of the blue, uh, he had a stroke on stage while he was preaching. And uh, he started his message over. And he had to be removed from the stage and the board of the church. They, they asked him if, if he would retire. His health had deteriorated and they hired another guy who was a beautiful guy, but he was just a few years older than me. And when he came, uh, he had his own plans for the youth ministry. He, he had his own guy that he wanted to bring with him. And so I was graciously let go. <laughs> One of my heroes, uh, Dr. Rich Wilkerson, he, he called me when I was let go and told me that his father-in-law in Tacoma, Washington was looking for a youth pastor. And he said, you need to go work for Pop at at Life Center in Tacoma. And so they set up for Pastor Sonny and I to go out for an interview and we flew to Seattle and they picked us up and I, I went and man, I preached that night on a Wednesday night. And man, I, guys, listen, I'm not trying to be arrogant. Man, I killed that room. I was like, man, they're gonna be tripping when they hear me preach. And, and the next day, Pastor Buntain took us to lunch at Sherry's Restaurant. It is kind of like a Perkins. And, sat down at a little table and he had a piece of strawberry pie. I'll never forget it. Looked across the table. I thought he was gonna talk about my sermon. I thought he was gonna talk about the interview process. I thought he was gonna talk about how much his grandkids loved me, thought I was cool, whatever. Literally, he looked across the table and this is the only question he asked me in the interview. Are you teachable? Hmm. He said, if you're teachable, 
we can hire you. If you're not, <laughs> we're going to have to find somebody else. God, this was one of the largest churches on the West Coast. This was like a flagship church. It was like a dream job of any young guy in youth ministry. It was like putting you, if there had been social media, it would have been like putting you in the influencer status. He didn't care about any of that. He didn't even listen to my message. He didn't ask his grandkids. All he asked me is, can you be teachable? Because Jesus people, we're teachable. We humbly accept instruction from others. We actually seek opportunities to learn, to grow, to become more self-aware. We're, we're team players. We, we use words like we, not I, and ours, not mine, because we aren't people who point to ourselves. We're people who point to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And so Jesus people, we are teachable. Here's, here's the fifth. Finally, as Jesus people, we're inspired. You know, the word inspiration or the word inspire, it literally means to breathe into. Jesus people are waiting. They're looking for Jesus to breathe. You know, God created the earth with a breath and the breath of God created everything. The word, the breath of life. And so as Jesus people, we're inspired. We're filled with the breath of God and we want that breath to come in us as we inhale so that it'll go from us as we exhale. And so as Jesus people, and I know for some of you this sounds totally foreign, but if you've been around Pastor Sonny and I for very long, this is gonna just sound like what our mantra is. So as Jesus people, God wants us to dream big, to go after more. Jesus people, we're entrepreneurs, we're innovators, we're visionaries, we're, we're creators and creatives, we're dreamers and we're doers. We find our best trait, we figure that out. And then we install it into our DNA. We learn our best trait, we know our purpose, and through those things we inspire others. A couple of weeks ago, I, I was in California on a precursor to uh, a message that I was gonna speak a couple of weeks later in Sacramento, and so I went to one of the church's other campuses in Newport Beach, and a couple of the board members, they're a husband and wife team, they met us at a hotel and they took us to dinner. Having a conversation with them, it was a beautiful conversation. They knew a bunch of people that we knew. They were connected to people that we were connected to. They were related to the Wilkerson's and the Buntains. I mean, he, he owned property in Tacoma where Life Center was. My pastor and his pastor were best friends for 40 years. It was just this really beautiful conversation where we were connecting as humans. Uh, and then he began to talk to me about business. It was like a weird kind of change in the tenor of the conversation. He began to talk to me about the stress that he was feeling in his life. He, he said that he owned mobile home parks, 13 of them in different states. In fact, he had just sold one in Las Vegas, Nevada, and it was 60 acres off the strip in Las Vegas. And he's slowly trying to retire, but slowly trying to figure out how to do that. And, and so he talked to me about how just the week before that, he, he had had uh, a manager of one of his communities quit. He had a manager of one of his communities come down with COVID and had to be quarantined for 14 days. It shut down the operations of their community. He had a third who had died suddenly, and they didn't know it for two days until one of the residents figured out that they hadn't been answering their door. They had a swimming pool in one of their communities that something happened and it, it became infected with something and he, he had to literally you know, drain the pool, sanitize the pool. He said it cost more to fix the pool than it had cost to put the pool in. And, and he's you know, in his 60s and he's trying to figure out how do I manage all of this stuff. And, and he said, uh, I said, well, why don't you just sell the communities? I'll get rid of them all. And, and this is what he said. Sean, what would I do with the money? 
I said, well, now he had already established the fact that he was a huge tither, that he'd been tithing, you know, his whole life since he's a kid with the paper route, that he's a huge contributor. They're very generous. They support lots of different nonprofits. And so it wasn't a matter of me saying, well, if you just tithe, he said, like, what am I going to do with the money? And so, you know, I've, I've been taking my MBA, so I understand finance a little bit. And so I said, well, bro, why don't you just 1031 it rather than have it be in 13 different locations in two states? Your kids live in Newport. You have a home in Newport. Why don't you just take that money and 1031 it into Newport and just invest in property here? He goes, it's, it's half a billion dollars worth of property. <laughs> I was like, bro, it, it, like that's not a number you hear a lot. And I, I said, whoa, 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 hold up, homie. Like, did you just say you own $500 million worth of property? He said, yeah. I said, no, nah, man, we, you should have led with that when we started dinner. Like, how? He said, well, first of all, from the very minute I was a kid, I dedicated every dollar that I ever made to God. I was always faithful in tithing. I always gave above and beyond. I've always been passionate about missions. I've always been a person who wants to invest in the things that God is doing. He said, I, I just guess I'm just a kingdom guy. And I figure I don't actually have a half a billion dollars. I have half a billion dollars in resources that I have been given to steward, that I have been given to manage. And so could I make money? Could I, 1031, could I put, yeah. But I feel like the Holy Spirit would have me continue to do what I'm doing because it's most beneficial to the kingdom this way. <sighs> Guys, I left that dinner. I got back to my room and I texted him. I said, my friend, I, I told you that I'm in my MBA. We operate some businesses, some rental properties, but uh, I have lots of spiritual mentors in my life. But I have for about a year been feeling like the Lord wanted me to take on a business mentor. And would you be my business mentor? See, Jesus people see the world a little bit differently. We see a future of huge possibilities. In other words, we're opposite to the world. And by being opposite to the world, that makes us people who, in the end, yes, we will be blessed, and yes, we will be happy, but we are going to be persecuted. And we are going to be persecuted because of righteousness. And that, that's an intimidating word to some people, but you know, righteous just means right living. We are going to be persecuted just because we live right. Because living right is opposite to the world. And, and it often creates complications and conflict from people who just want us to conform. But guys, Jesus people, we can't conform. In fact, the Bible says, don't be conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And when you do that, you'll be able to be tested and you will be approved for what's good, for what's pleasing, and what's the perfect will of God. And so we can't conform because when people insult us, when they persecute us, when they say all kinds of ugly, evil, even dishonest stuff about us, we'll be blessed. Our reward, it's going to be great because we are Jesus people. We're life-giving, kind, peaceful, teachable, and inspired people. So today I think about that and I wonder, are you those things? I hope so, because if you're not, you won't be blessed. You won't be happy. Because you can't be. Because honestly, if you're not, you're actually not a Jesus person. But I got great news today. You can be. You can be right now. I wonder, do you, do you want that? It's a simple, process. It's not easy. It's not an easy life. As you, as you just heard, you're, you're going to be persecuted. It's like telling somebody, if you do this, life's going to be hard. Life's going to be difficult. But in the end, man, it's going to be great. My dad worked over 30 years at Ford Motor Company and he never loved it. It, it wasn't a, 
a thing that I think he sprung up out the bed every morning and was like, yay, I get to go to Ford. But he was faithful and he was faithful because he had a goal. He knew that he wanted me to be blessed, my brothers to be blessed. And he knew that in the end, he'd be able to retire and Ford would have invested in a pension for him. And that's what salvation is similar to. It's like making a lifelong investment that even though sometimes you won't love it, even though sometimes it'll be difficult, even though sometimes it'll be downright painful, in the end, you will be blessed. And so it's not easy, but it is simple. In fact, the Bible says, all you have to do to be saved is to acknowledge with your mouth that you are a sinner and believe in your heart that Jesus can change that. And so if you want to be saved, if you want to be a Jesus person today, it's as simple as this. I'm going to say a few lines in a prayer. And if you repeat those after me and you mean them in your heart, then the Bible says you'll be saved. You'll be a Jesus person. And so if you want that, would you say this? Say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm a sinner. Would you forgive me? Would you change me? Would you come into my life? Would you make me different? Would you make, make me new? Would you be my Lord and be my Savior in Jesus' name? Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, you just became a Jesus person. You're my brother now or you're my sister. And so there's nothing that I wouldn't do for you. We are family. And so I would love the opportunity to know you. I would love to connect with you. And so if you would just reach out to us, send us a message and let us know that you prayed that prayer. We'll do everything we can to connect with you and to build a beautiful lifelong relationship with you. But maybe you're watching this. You say, Sean, I am a Jesus guy and or I am a Jesus girl. But you'd say, I don't know, man. There, there's one or two or a couple of those things that you talked about today that I, I'm kind of doing. I'm kind of half in on it. But gosh, they're tough. I've been there. And so if that's you, can I pray for you? You're not living all five of those things and you want to. God, for my friends who are watching this right now, who are struggling in one or two or five areas, God, I pray for strength, pray for mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. will not fail me now. you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out You're working all things out oh yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley
this moment doesn't have to end now. The things you are thinking about, you're questioning, you're mauling over right now, have a conversation with someone. Call someone up and talk about this. Or if you're with someone right now, you could go to lifechurchgreenbay.com or text discussion to 97000. There you can download discussion questions to prompt even more. And if you'd rather listen, try out the Chew On That podcast, where Pastor Scott and a guest talk every week about this very message. You'll find these discussion questions you download will help you with whether you're new to Jesus or you've known Jesus for decades. Either way, they will help you on your Jesus journey.